Chapter 1 Critical Mass Later, as he sat on his balcony eating the dog, Dr. Robert Lang reflected on the unusual events that had taken place within this huge apartment building during the previous three months. Now that everything had returned to normal, he was surprised that there had been no obvious beginning, no point beyond which their lives had moved into a clearly more sinister dimension. With its forty floors and thousand apartments, its supermarket and swimming pools, bank and junior school, all, in effect, abandoned in the sky, the high-rise offered more than enough opportunities for violence and confrontation. Certainly his own studio apartment on the 25th floor was the last place Lang would have chosen as an early skirmish ground. This overpriced cell, slotted almost at random into the cliff face of the apartment building, he had bought after his divorce specifically for its peace, quiet, and anonymity. Curiously enough, despite all Lang's efforts to detach himself from his two thousand neighbours and the regime of trivial disputes and irritations that provided their only corporate life, it was here, if anywhere, that the first significant event had taken place. On this balcony, where he now squatted beside a fire of telephone directories, eating the roast hind quarter of the Alsatian before setting off to his lecture at the medical school. While preparing breakfast soon after eleven o'clock one Saturday morning three months earlier, Dr. Lang was startled by an explosion on the balcony outside his living room. A bottle of sparkling wine had fallen from a floor fifty feet above, ricocheted off an awning as it hurtled downwards and burst across the tiled balcony floor. The living room carpet was speckled with foam and broken glass. Lang stood in his bare feet among the sharp fragments, watching the agitated wine seethe across the cracked tiles. High above him, on the thirty-first floor, a party was in progress. He could hear the sounds of deliberately over-animated chatter, the aggressive blare of a record player. Presumably the bottle had been knocked over the rail by a boisterous guest. Needless to say, no one at the party was in the least concerned about the ultimate destination of this missile. But as Lang had already discovered, people in high-rises tended not to care about tenants more than two floors below them. Trying to identify the apartment, Lang stepped across the spreading pool of cold froth. Sitting there, he might easily have found himself with the longest hangover in the world. He leaned out over the rail and peered up at the face of the building, carefully counting the balconies. As usual, though, the dimensions of the forty-story block made his head reel. Lowering his eyes to the tiled floor, he steadied himself against the door pillar. The immense volume of open space that separated the building from the neighbouring high-rise a quarter of a mile away unsettled his sense of balance. At times, he felt that he was living in the gondola of a ferris wheel permanently suspended three hundred feet above the ground. Nonetheless, Lang was still exhilarated by the high-rise, one of five identical units in the development project, and the first to be completed and occupied. Together they were set in a mile-square area of abandoned dockland and warehousing along the north bank of the river. The five high-rises stood on the eastern perimeter of the project, looking out across an ornamental lake, at present an empty concrete basin surrounded by parking lots and construction equipment. On the opposite shore stood the recently completed concert hall, with Lang's medical school and the new television studios on either side. The massive scale of the glass and concrete architecture and its striking situation on a bend of the river sharply separated the development project from the run-down areas around it. Decaying 19th-century terraced houses and empty factories already zoned for reclamation. For all the proximity of the city, two miles away to the west along the river, the office buildings of central London belonged to a different world, in time as well as space. Their glass curtain walling and telecommunication aerials were obscured by the traffic smog, blurring Lang's memories of the past. Six months earlier, when he had sold the lease of his Chelsea house and moved to the security of the high-rise, he had travelled forward fifty years in time, away from crowded streets, traffic hold-ups, rush-hour journeys on the underground to student supervisions in a shared office in the old teaching hospital. Here, on the other hand, the dimensions of his life were space, 
light, and the pleasures of a subtle kind of anonymity. The drive to the physiology department of the medical school took him five minutes, and apart from this single excursion, Lang's life in the high-rise was as self-contained as the building itself. In effect, the apartment block was a small vertical city, its 2,000 inhabitants boxed up into the sky. The tenants corporately owned the building, which they administered themselves through a resident manager and his staff. For all its size, the high-rise contained an impressive range of services. The entire tenth floor was given over to a wide concourse, as large as an aircraft carrier's flight deck, which contained a supermarket, bank and hairdressing salon, a swimming pool and gymnasium, a well-stocked liquor store and a junior school for the few young children in the block. High above Lang, on the 35th floor, was a second, smaller swimming pool, a sauna and a restaurant. Delighted by this glut of conveniences, Lang made less and less effort to leave the building. He unpacked his record collection and played himself into his new life, sitting on his balcony and gazing across the parking lots and concrete plazas below him.